Antibiotic drugs are a miracle of modern medicine that we take completely for granted. Well, soon we might not be able to do that anymore. Soon we might be looking back to the amazing time when we didn't have to think twice about routine surgery because infections could easily be treated. Because with a steady rise of antibiotic resistance, those days might soon be gone. Well, how big a problem is it? Are there possibilities for how we might keep the things we now take for granted and what do we need to do about it? Well, let's have a look. Antibiotic drugs are derived from spore-forming microbes. Their introduction was the greatest medical breakthrough, certainly of the 20th century, arguably of all time. Not only do they treat various infectious diseases, some of which were routine killers for centuries previously, but they made many modern medical procedures even possible, including cancer treatment, organ transplants, open heart surgery. As a result, they've been a major cause of extended life expectancy by approximately 23 years and saved millions of lives that would otherwise have been lost. In addition, they routinely shortened the course of common infections, alleviated unpleasant symptoms and speeded up recovery for countless millions upon millions of people. An estimated 80 to 90 percent are prescribed for oral use in primary care. Half of prescriptions are for respiratory infections, another one six for urinary tract infections. Antibiotics are not, or at least should not be, given to patients for coughs, colds and viral sore throats. And I say should not, because in recent history it's been evidence that they often have been. GPs may suggest that they prescribe them for minor infections because of concerns over complications, although that's not really justified by the data about the likelihood of such complications. Others suggest that they're just rationalising being bullied into prescribing antibiotics when they shouldn't by patients who are fixated on that as their preferred outcome. And it matters because overuse of such drugs leads to the potential rise, and often the actual rise, in resistant strains of bacteria. And we've seen that from the earliest days. The first antibiotic, Salvarsan, was put into use in 1910. The discovery of penicillin in 1928 started what's described as the golden age of natural product antibiotic discovery, where important new drugs were being discovered at a rapid pace. That peaked in the 1950s. Now, the first penicillin-resistant bacteria was found in 1947, just four years after it had gone into mass production. As the resistance spread, the antibiotic mefisilin came forward to take the lead instead. The first mefisilin resistant strains of bacteria causing pneumonia and surgical wound infections appeared in 1961. The MRSA strains have now become common worldwide. In the US, antibiotic resistant MRSA is responsible for more than 50% of all infections picked up in hospitals. Then doctors moved to vancomycin. The first vancomycin-resistant bacteria appeared in 1987 in Europe, making it to the US by 1989. More bacteria types with resistance to vancomycin appeared over the following decade, which was concerning because it had become the drug of last resort. So, what's the current state of play? Well, the answer's mixed. Antibiotics are widely used and generally continue to work, but resistance is growing and spreading. Here's one map giving just one example, which is the prevalence and spread of E. coli bacteria that are resistant to the key antibiotic used against it, fluoroquinolones. This paper from Frelfall in 2002 found that strains of resistant salmonella are now found worldwide, which get transmitted from animals to people through food. A recent report suggested that diphtheria, which was a leading cause of death in children worldwide in the early 20th century, is showing the first signs of becoming resistant to antibiotics. The US Centre for Disease Dynamics, Economics and Policy, CDDEP, developed what they called the Drug Resistance Index. Because of the complications of all the different drugs and all the different stages of resistance, they tried to produce a single figure that was drawn from antibiotic consumption and resistance data. It was designed to give some relatively blunt but realistic sense of how the problems were distributed and where antibiotics are and are not being used effectively. 
They found that higher income countries were more likely to be using antibiotics effectively, with low and middle income countries less so. Sweden, with a score of 8.1, was the best performer, followed by Canada, 9.7, Norway, 16.5, Finland, 20.2, and Denmark, 24.1. The United States was not far off that leading group. Countries with the lowest effectiveness included India at 71.6, Thailand at 60.6, and Ecuador at 60.3. The lower income countries that have the least effectiveness also, as you might expect, have the highest burden of disease. Many people can't get access to the newer, more effective drugs, and this leads to an overall lower level of antibiotic awareness. Australia and the UK were in the middle, by the way, with disappointingly high scores, I would suggest. This map shows the significant variation in antibiotic prescribing across the UK. So, for instance, 8.4% of patients in Newcastle West received an antibiotic prescription in 2012. Only 4% were so prescribed in Camden in North London. Across Europe, Greece had one of the highest rates of antibiotic consumption, with the Netherlands reporting the lowest rates. The fact those disparities exist suggests that there's a lot of scope for safely reducing antibiotic use in some of those countries and areas. And all this matters. If antibiotics were to lose their effectiveness completely, the cost would be massive and tragic for many. In 2016, the UK government sponsored the O'Neill Report to look into this, which reported that if current trends continued, 10 million people a year would be dying from drug-resistant infections by 2050. Even with antibiotics mostly working, infectious diseases are the second highest cause of deaths worldwide, Without them, every annual flu season would bring a much higher death count due to pneumonia, tuberculosis and typhoid fever might become impossible to treat, and more. So why is resistance growing so fast? At some level, resistance would always have developed naturally, even if we'd been highly disciplined in the use of antibiotics. It happens through inevitable spontaneous mutations, the process of which we've become rather familiar with, with the various covert variant discussions, but also with horizontal gene transfer among neighbouring bacteria. It's generally been assumed that when such mutations happen, you get less dangerous variants because... As always, it's good evolutionary practice not to kill your host if you're a bacteria or a virus. However, recent research has shown that recent strains of the tuberculosis bacteria can be just as aggressive. So it would have happened at some speed regardless, but there's no doubt it's been significantly boosted by antibiotic overuse. It happens in affluent countries, but that's nothing compared to the abuse of the drugs in the rest of the world. For instance, in 2001, it was noted that in India, more than 80 companies made ciprofloxacin without license from Bayer, which owns the patent. Almost 100% of the healthy population carries bacteria resistant to several common antibiotics. European rates of resistance at the time were between 5% and 40%. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that antibiotic use has also had a huge benefit in those countries. According to the 2016 Global Burden of Disease study, the worldwide deaths from infectious disease dramatically decreased from 13 million deaths in 1990 to 10 million in 2016. And that was mainly driven by the decline of deaths from antibiotic susceptible infections. Other factors that have promoted the development of resistance are poor sanitation in hospitals and the routine massive use of prophylactic antibiotics in animal husbandry. For instance, antibiotic use in the United States is routine in the nation's barns and feedlots as farmers try to prevent disease in poultry and pigs and to help them to grow faster. A 2015 study by Boeke et al estimated that globally more than 130,000 tonnes of antibiotics were used in animals in 2013. They projected the number would surpass 200,000 tonnes by 2030. The practice encourages the growth of resistant bacteria that then move up the food chain to the point where it reaches us. And it's not just the food chain aspect. Resistant bacteria are found in animal manure, soils, drainage water... Animals globally produce more than four times more feces than humans. It's a whole lot of poo.
In addition to those aspects, there's growing evidence that environmental factors can be just as important in the developing world. Over 70% of the world has no community wastewater treatment or sewers, and most faecal matter containing those resistant bacteria goes directly into surface and groundwater, often via open drains, which means that people who live in those places are regularly exposed to antibiotic resistance, whether or not they've ever taken antibiotics themselves. Which means that more effective use of antibiotics isn't the only thing that needs doing. There also needs to be worldwide improvements in water quality, sanitation and hygiene. Well, we knew that already, of course, but for many of us, it was a foreign problem. It happened over there. It wasn't something that affected us directly. We now know only too well that diseases travel easily. For example, antibiotic resistance, the superbug gene BLANDM1, was first detected in India in 2007. Shortly afterwards, it was found in Sweden, then in Germany. So we do have a problem. We need to slow the pace of that problem down. And then ultimately we need an alternative to the things that at some point are going to stop working. So what are people trying to do about it? And are they being successful? Well, there's lots of things that help. On a purely practical level, vaccinating against a number of diseases can reduce the demand for antibiotics in the first place. Scrupulous infection control in hospitals, Cautious prescribing, cautious but not too cautious, in spite of the good news in the reductions of deaths from infectious diseases in developing countries, the truth is that many people in low and middle income countries continue to die because they can't get access to antibiotics. And regulators have been taking action in some areas. The European Union banned antibiotics as growth promoters in animals, only allowing their use to treat sick animals. And in the US, likewise, medically important antibiotics for the use of growth promotion and feed efficiency was banned in 2017. Likewise, there are numerous programmes to help improve sanitation in developing countries, which has been seen a desirable outcome even before it was linked to antibiotic resistance. But ultimately, effective action is difficult. And it comes down to a system failure. The truth is that patients, doctors, hospitals, particularly pharmaceutical companies, agricultural users, none of them have incentives to act in ways that would protect antibiotic effectiveness. And people follow the incentives that are in front of them. So, for instance, there are three reasons why the market fails in this regard. One, the pharmaceutical industry will make more money from producing broadly effective drugs rather than tightly targeted ones for obvious reasons. Which is fine, except those are more likely to lead to resistance in a wide range of bacteria than narrow spectrum drugs that are more selective. Two, we reduce resistance by using the least amount of a drug that we can while still being effective. The market rewards manufacturers for selling as much product as possible, so the incentives are completely non-aligned. And three, companies don't have an incentive to discover new classes of drugs. It's more financially lucrative to produce drugs that are just marginal evolutions on existing products which are drugs that don't replenish our store of effectiveness. According to an analysis in 2019, antibiotics approved between 1999 and 2014 failed to address urgent resistance threats. It highlighted the lack of a global research and development strategy to incentivise innovation to fill in important gaps. Market signals don't automatically account for such things. Indeed, antibiotic development has slowed considerably in recent decades, with few new antibiotics reaching the market and only two new classes of antibiotics. The reasons for the decline include the scientific challenges in discovering new compounds, it's time-consuming and expensive and it often fails, it can take 10 to 15 years and over a billion dollars to develop a new antibiotic, Then there's high levels of competition from already approved antibiotics that for now are still working and the risk that new antibiotics will become ineffective in just a few years due to resistance. And all that for a drug that should be used sparingly. So this is why we end up with gaps. Ultimately, if companies can't recover their costs and make a profit, then why would they go ahead with them? So they'll look for classes of drugs where that's possible. As a result, the large pharmaceutical companies have increasingly pulled out of the field. 
In the 1980s, there were 18 multinational corporations committed to antibiotics. Today, that's down to a bare handful. Antibiotic developments now 90% driven by small biotechnology companies, often funded by partnerships between governments and philanthropic organisations. But it's not easy for those players. Antibiotic startups like Acogen, Aradyme and Melinta Therapeutics have gone bust in recent years. Others have been teetering on the brink. So it's kind of a grim picture. There are currently between 40 and 50 antibiotics in clinical development, many of which will bring only limited benefits compared to existing treatments. Only a few target what's called gram-negative bacteria, which are the dangerous resistant bacteria causing things like pneumonia, blood infections or meningitis. The preclinical pipeline is looking more interesting, with some innovative and diverse candidate drugs amongst over 250 in early stage development. But it takes up to 10 years for the first of those to reach market, and many will fail along the way. On average, only one in every 15 drugs from existing classes in that early stage makes it all the way through. The figure for drugs in new classes is 1 in 30. Things have moved on a lot from the golden age when new antibiotic classes were being discovered almost every year by isolating organisms from soil samples. What signs of hope are there on the horizon? Well, there is some realisation that only a tiny fraction of the soils have been sampled for antibiotic producers. Sampling more widely is likely to uncover new strains. Sampling previously underexplored environments that were not previously accessible, including, for instance, the marine environment, is yielding new chemical structures. But then there are other routes, specifically the realisation that engineered viruses could be a vehicle for fighting the rise of antibiotic bacteria. For viruses that are the villain of the current pandemic, could turn out to be the heroes of the next. As an alternative to antibiotics, some researchers are looking at a natural enemy of bacteria, bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. They outnumber bacteria 10 to 1. They're considered to be the most abundant organisms on the planet. Known as phages, they survive by infecting bacteria, replicating and bursting out alien-like from their host, which, as you would expect, destroys that host. Phages were co-discovered at the turn of the 20th century by French microbiologist Félix Derelle. It's actually a remarkable story because the discovery was initially recognised as important and was commercially successful. Darrell used phage to treat children suffering from severe dysentery. He used it to stop cholera outbreaks in India and plague in Egypt. Drug companies began to market phage and it was used to treat various diseases. Sinclair Lewis used them as the inspiration for his Pulitzer Prize winning novel Arrowsmith. Between 1917 and 1956, over 800 papers on the use of phage were published in scientific journals. You might ask why it's not a household word today. Although there was huge success in the 1920s and 1930s, research in North America was largely abandoned in the 40s. Durrell was a man with an unpleasant temper who made enemies easily. He became enamoured with communism, as practised by Stalin in the Soviet Union. It's been suggested that for those non-scientific factors, his project fell out of favour with the scientific community. There were claims that the trials carried out by Durrell didn't meet scientific standards for research. And the fact is that the introduction of penicillin to medical practice gave an alternative avenue of development that was effective. That alone didn't make full scientific sense. Farge was effective against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. It had the ability to multiply exponentially when in the presence of bacteria, so it could be highly effective and selective. It has no known side effects, could be produced at low cost. Penicillin, by contrast, had weak activity against gram-negative bacteria and could have significant side effects. In fact, in St Mary's Hospital in London in 1945, F. Himmelwhite looked at using phage in combination with penicillin as a cross-therapy to reduce the possibility of penicillin-resistant bacteria, an approach that seemed very promising. But in spite of the fact that penicillin-resistant bacteria soon emerged, the approach and the possibility offered were forgotten. In the event, it may have been the Soviet taint that did it. 
after World War II, phage therapy research was carried out only in Eastern European countries and it became an ideological association. Not helped probably by Daryl accepting Stalin's invitation to carry on his work in the Soviet Union. And possibly also not helped by Daryl's belief that phages were the whole basis for how the body eventually fights off disease in contradiction to the then emerging evidence about immunology. So we do have the possibility that this historically buried treasure comes to become rather important in our current context. There are challenges. Phages have to be able to comply with current regulatory requirements. So for instance, here are some of the properties of phages. One, they're naturally occurring. We can find phages for most bacteria in their native environment. Because, you know, where you find a thing, you'll usually find a predator for that thing. Two, it multiplies in the presence of its target bacteria, so the effective dose becomes amplified. And that's great in theory, because it means you don't need high doses. But this aspect, what's referred to as pharmacokinetics, is complex, and it's not well understood. The potential for unforeseen consequences mean you have to give it some serious basic study. Three, the target host range is very selective and could be too selective to be effective in important cases. Now, phages can be genetically modified using CRISPR techniques to have the desired ranges. That would mean they could target the DNA in the bacteria that's specifically resistant to antibiotics, which would be wonderful. But they then become genetically modified organisations. Some people have all sorts of issues with the idea of people being injected with those. At the very least, a whole bunch more testing comes in as standard. And finally, phages contain DNA or RNA as their genetic material. And the presence of DNA or RNA introduces a safety hazard in the form of transfer of non-human DNA into a human host. Now, a number of companies such as Felix Biotechnology and Cytophage are working on engineering phages or finding naturally occurring ones. And there may be a way to work around those disadvantages. There's a parallel track using phage-related proteins, enzymes, called lysins. These proteins are much less complex molecules in comparison to whole phages and could be more compatible with our normal drug development processes. So the dose is definable, there's no amplification in host. The lysins can be engineered to recognise the target bacterium without genetic modification. And lysins are free of DNA and RNA. There are still questions that need to be studied in detail because again, these are novel, not entirely understood therapies. Phages and phage-based lysins are currently subject to very strict regulation and a number of concerns need to be dealt with, such as possible toxicity, provoking antibody responses from immune systems, and so on. Research to date shows few problems in those areas, but relatively few studies have so far been published. There's a long way still to go. It's hope for the future, but not an immediate get-out-of-jail-free card. So in conclusion, I suppose the takeaway is this. The world desperately needs to slow the resistance to its most important antibiotics, that means finding ways to hit the balance between reaching all of those who need treatment and treating without constraint. None of it's easy because infections, for instance from surgery, can be caused by many different pathogens which need to be treated by a multitude of drugs. The complexity of all that gets hidden by the way the mainstream media talk about superbugs. There needs to be a better pipeline of new drugs and that means focusing on the rewards and risk mitigation for market entry by companies. The O'Neill report, commissioned by the UK government, which I mentioned earlier, suggested giving lump sum payments to successful developers of new antibiotics. There's also a subscription-style payment model, which the UK government has announced that it's piloting. That involves paying pharmaceutical companies up front for access to drugs based on their usefulness to the health service. So I guess that's to get away from the standard commercial logic that higher drug use equals more profit. The NHS pays, but then uses in moderation. Some would point at that as questionable value for money in terms of you know, what that represents to UK taxpayers, but it's an attempt to get around that commercial obstacle because the alternative is not to have the effective drugs at all, which is pretty bad value to the taxpayers. 
Among the pharmaceutical companies that are still committed to research and development in antibiotics, some have started to adapt their practices. So, for instance, removing financial bonuses tied to sales so that their salespeople are not rewarded for shipping the highest possible volumes. The possibilities are there if governments and companies and the world health community gave it focus and importance. As with the pandemic, it seems likely that by the time we get by the pointy end of this problem, we'll have been sort of talking about it for decades, and yet we will manage nevertheless to be surprised by the scale and the nature of the consequences as they arrive. Are we capable of seeing an approaching problem and acting in good time? Are we capable of genuinely following science with political will and resources? Well, it would be a brave person who bet on it. 